For the next five minutes or so, I'm going to give a brief overview of the finite element analysis technique for solving structural analysis problems. Let's start with a simple example. Suppose you want to find out what happens inside of this bell when you would strike it. So this would be a solid structure. What we want to do with finite elements is to break this structure into a bunch of small pieces, all of which can be described, described in a very simple fashion. For example, this might be one description of that bell in finite elements. What we've done is break the structure into a bunch of very small pieces, each of which have simple geometry as well as a simple description of how a force relates to a displacement. So that would be our finite element description. If we take a closer look at that structure of elements, you can see maybe an example pulled out here. The description of what goes on inside of each element effectively is a bunch of springs. What we do is we take all of the points at the corners of a single element, and we connect them to all of the other points by a series of springs. So for example, here is my element where I've got the points at the corners. We call these nodes. And we establish a series of uh, internal force deflection relationships, or spring relationships, using the standard F equals KF spring rule. So we connect all of the outside corners with each other. And in addition, we're going to include uh, diagonal corners. So basically, every node in this element is connected to every other node by a type of spring. Um, in addition, if we look at, say, a 2D view, it would look something like this, with the springs around the outside, as well as springs across the center. This is not actually what FEA does, but it's a good visualization tool. Our solid structure is replaced by a whole bunch of springs connecting points to each other. And what the key is to define the spring relationships in a manner that is going to capture what that little piece of material would do when you would apply a load to it. Now let's take it down a notch just to, to look at something a little bit simpler to understand the details of what's going on in there. Imagine you have a solid steel bar and we want to determine a finite element for this bar. The finite element description might look like this. I have a node 1 and a node 2 and they are connected by some sort of a stiffness relationship that I'll just label as K at this point. In order to create a finite element model of this bar, we need to talk about what we know about each of these, the bar, and what we need to know about the finite element. So if we look at the bar, first off, mainly what we know there is a stress-strain relationship. Specifically, we know that the stress in the bar is equal to the Young's modulus times the strain. Uh, we might also say that we know a little something about how strain relates to displacements. So, for example, in the axial direction, we know that strain is equal to the derivative of the displacement with respect to x. Um, so that's as an example. If we look to the uh, right hand, so now looking at the finite element model itself, what we'd like to do is use this information sigma equals E epsilon and epsilon equals du dx, to get to the point that we can have a spring relationship defined. In other words, we want something like F equals K times U. I'm using U as opposed to X. X would be position U is displacement. So F equals KU. Um, the key is how do we get from one to the other? So to link the bar to the bar finite element model, the first thing that we need to do is put some labels onto our finite element. We need to define some terms. And in particular, because we're talking about displacements and forces, let's label those. So you can see I've added down here, node 1 has a force acting in the positive x direction that I call F1. Node 2 has a force acting in the positive x direction that I call F2. In addition, of course, we need to have displacements. So node 1 is going to have a displacement that I'll label U1. Again, it's positive in the positive x direction. U2 is the displacement in the positive x direction at node 2. Throw a little bit more terminology at you here. The uh, U's are degrees of freedom, a general term. They are displacements at nodes or nodal displacements. But in general, they are called degrees of freedom. A degree of freedom is an ability for a point to move. Um, and the points that we're interested in are the nodes. In addition, I've labeled the, the Fs as nodal forces. So these are important terms as we move forward.
Using these definitions, let's see if we can formulate the finite element model in more detail. Let's find the link between the bar and the finite element. So what I'm going to do is draw the bar, but here I'm going to cut it in half, roughly in half, and then I'm going to apply some forces and use some statics to see if I can define what's going on. So over on the left side of the bar where my node 1 is, I'm putting in my F1. And over on the right side, F2. Now where I've cut the bar, we know that that's where the internal stress exists. Here's how, this is how I'm creating the link between stress and force. So I can say that the force acting on the bar at that cut is sigma times A. So if I write an equation of equilibrium on the left side, I'm going to get F1 plus sigma A is equal to zero. On the right side, I will get negative sigma A plus F2 equals zero. The negative sign showing up because I'm summing forces in the positive x direction. So now we've got stresses. We need to think about how those relate. And we've got a couple of equations to help us out, remember. We know that the stress is equal to Young's modulus times the strain. And we also know that the strain is the derivative of this displacement with respect to x. So, given this relationship, can we use that to take us a step further to actually create a force deflection relationship? So here's the big FEA assumption. We need to assume how in this element, displacement varies with respect to position. Big, big assumption we're making about um, displacements. So let's assume it's linear. U of x equals a plus bx. We can take this a step further though. We can more precisely define displacement in terms of terms that we've already discussed. In particular, um, the u1 and u2 terms, the displacement at node 1, the left end where x equals 0, and the displacement at node 2, the right end where x equals l. So if I write those two equations out, u of 0 equals u1, u of l equals u2, and then plug them into the expression for u of x equals a plus bx, I find that u1 is just going to be equal to a, and u2 is going to be equal to a plus bl. Let's rearrange those two terms to get a and b, the two unknowns in our equation for u, defined in terms of u1 and u2. So A is just U1, that's obvious. B is equal to U2 minus U1 divided by L. So we plug this into the U of X expression and we find that U of X is equal to U1 plus the quantity U2 minus U1 times X over L. And now using this expression with our known relationship between strain and displacement, we can find that epsilon is equal to du dx, that's our definition, and for this assumed displacement field, that means epsilon is equal to u2 minus u1 divided by L. Let's bring this back to the, our original two equations for the two halves of our finite element f1 plus sigma a equals 0, and minus sigma a plus f2 equals 0. But now instead of sigma, if I plug in e epsilon, and then plug in that epsilon is equal to u2 minus u1 divided by l, I get on the left-hand side, f1 plus ae over l times u2 minus u1 equals 0. Rearranging terms, I find that f1 is equal to negative ae over l times u2 minus u1, and if I want, I can rewrite that as f equals ku, or k delta x, as we might call it if we were referring to uh, a spring. So we have our spring expression. Following through the same technique on the right-hand side, negative ae over l times u2 minus u1 is what that first term becomes, plus f2 equals 0. Rearranging terms then, we'll get F2 is equal to AE over L times U2 minus U1. Again, it'd be stiffness times a delta X term. We can write this whole thing as a matrix equation. So F1 
F2, being our force vector, is equal to AE over L, which is our general coefficient, that's our stiffness term, but it's going to be multiplied by a matrix, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. All of that will be multiplied by the displacement vector, U1, U2. And what we've done then is write our first finite element equation. Formal finite element equation is a force vector is equal to a stiffness matrix times a displacement vector. So that's how FEA gets formulated. So that wraps up our brief introduction to finite element analysis, what it is and how it's formulated at least for a simple element. Hopefully this, together with the uh, other videos I've asked you to watch, will prepare you for some activities we're going to do in class where we'll learn how to choose a good finite element for a particular application and how to tell if um, analysis results are good and how to get your finite element model set up in lab. See you in class.